if circumstances turn to gray this promise i believe there is freedom in the name of jesus there is free In Jesus we will trust When I am in a desert place I'll fix my eyes on chain in me. Jesus has the victory. Jesus, you alone can set me free.
spirit once again we're crying out from on our knees Lord send revival start with me hey I do
Kia ora and welcome to Summit Church. I'm Steph. And I'm Mark. And it's so good to have you joining us today. Whether you're a part of our church in Botany or a Summit Church in Hastings, just a very warm welcome. If you're joining us online, if you are from a different church and you're just hooking in with us today, welcome. Really warm welcome. Maybe this is your first time um, Mm. at a church service and we want to really warmly welcome you. We hope you feel um, really welcomed and really enjoy what um, we have to present today. Yeah, so good to have you with us. And if you, whether you're with us for the first time today or you're a part of our regular church family, uh, we'd love to, to connect with you. Uh, if you would jump in the online chat and introduce yourself, tell us who you are, where you're hooking in from today, uh, say hi. Uh, or if this is your first time, uh, jump on our website and, uh, and connect with us. There's a chat function there. There's a connect button there. Uh, Or just email us, unite at summitchurch.nz. We'd love to connect with you and journey with you. Mm, That's so good. And we want to just put a really big warm welcome out to the kids um, Mm. who are out there. If you are a kid from um, Summit Church, just really, really welcome you. You are an important part of our church and we love that you're connecting in with us. A little bit later on, um, there will be a slide that comes up. And that's a chance for you guys to go and connect in with your kids' programs. If you're a part of Exchange, our intermediate age youth group, you're welcome to go then mm. and connect with your um, Exchange program that will happen then as well. Yeah, I know some fun stuff lined yeah, up there. Yeah, so exciting. There today. Hey, uh, just before we, we enter into a time of, of worship as Robin and the team leads us, uh, would you join me as we, we pray together? Let's pray. Lord, uh, you're such a good God. You're so good to us. You pour out your your blessings on us day after day. And we are so grateful to, to belong to you, to know you. We just stand in, in awe of who you are, of your character, um, and of the way that you, you live that out. And we want to be people that live out, uh, yeah, live our lives in, in a way that um, that reflects who you are, that reflects your character. And Lord, we want to be people who, who uh, point others to you and point people to, to your goodness, to your worthiness. Lord, you are worthy of every good thing that we can say. You are worthy of every good action that we can take. Lord, our, our entire lives, we want to be an act of worship to you. Because you are so deserving of everything that we can do and say that is good. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Good morning. In a few moments, Brad is going to continue in our Exodus series. And throughout this amazing book, we've been seeing how awesome and incredible and powerful and holy and righteous our God is. He truly is worthy of our praise. So we want to sing about it this morning. Let's sing together.
God, and that's our prayer. Our prayer is that you are a worthy God that deserves all our honor and praise and adoration. And so we stand here this morning singing that to you, our God, our King, worthy of it all. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Let's sing holy. And holy. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in. Your heart and lead me in your love. 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Kia ora, Summer Church. Hey, it's great to be with you again as we jump back into our Our God series in the book of Exodus. And today we're in Exodus chapters 20 and 21 and 22. We're looking at a whole raft of the laws that God gave to Israel after he gave them the 10 words, the 10 commandments. And as I was thinking about these laws, it reminded me of some of the ridiculous laws that you find out are in existence in different countries and states around the world. Here's just a sampling for you. Hopefully you can see these pictures okay here. But uh, in New York, it's illegal to take a selfie with a tiger in the state of New York. In the country of Switzerland, it's illegal to flush a toilet in an apartment after 10 p.m. So once you've dumped, you just have to leave it for the night, I think. In Madagascar, it is against the law for pregnant women to wear a hat. Don't ask me why. In the state of North Carolina in the US, it is actually illegal to sing off key. In uh, Baltimore, it's illegal to take a lion with you to the movies. So I don't know why that's on the case books, but it is. In the state of Oregon, it's illegal to drive with a child sitting on the bonnet or the hood of your car. In Arkansas, it's against the law to mispronounce this, this, the name of the state, Arkansas. About 100 years ago, many people were saying Arkansas, and that is now illegal under their state laws. But my personal favorite ridiculous law it comes from the European country of Georgia that used to be part of the Soviet Union. In Georgia, there is actually a law that makes it illegal for the chicken to cross the road. And we hear about some of these laws and regulations and we roll our eyes and we wonder, why on earth would anyone enact that kind of law? And it's often the same response we can have when we read some of the laws in the Old Testament uh, that we're going to look at a portion of those today in Exodus. But you go through parts of Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, and we read some laws that often leave us scratching our heads. For example, Exodus 21, 17, anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. And we're all going, what? And all the teenagers are going, what? But that just sounds bizarre to us, doesn't it? Or what about this one in Exodus 23? Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk, which leaves all of us just scratching our heads and wonder why that would even be a law back then, let alone now. Or what about this in Leviticus 19? Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. I thought I was safe on this one because uh, the T-shirt that I'm wearing is 100% cotton, so I thought I was good. But then I checked the label on this sweatshirt that I've got on, and it's actually a cotton polyester mix. So I'm actually disobeying this particular law or rule from Leviticus 19. A few verses later, you read this one, do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard, which I disobey every time I go to the barber and ask for a number three around the back and sides. But this is why you'll see in movies or in photos, Orthodox Jewish men with long ringlets of hair coming down the sides of their faces, because this is one of the laws uh, within the book of the law in Exodus, in Leviticus in this case. Or of course, there's Deuteronomy 14 among this list of clean and unclean animals. 
the pig is unclean, you're not to eat their meat or touch their carcasses which our family broke last Sunday as we were watching church and we were having bacon and egg muffins together. But that raises a question, doesn't it? Why is it okay for me to wear a cotton polyester sweatshirt and, and to have the sides of my hair cut and to eat, uh, eat bacon and ham and pork? Why is that okay, but it's not okay to break other laws? How, how should we understand and relate to the laws of the Old Testament? And that's the, really the key question that I want to grapple with for a few minutes with you today. How do we understand and apply the Old Testament law as New Testament followers of Jesus? Because we're picking up in Exodus 20 at the end of the Ten Commandments, which serves as kind of the, the summary of God's law, the Ten Words. And now in the coming chapters, and we're going to look through 20, 21 and 22, now God's going to give lots and lots of extra laws about a whole raft of things. What do we do with those? How should we understand them and apply them as New Testament followers of Jesus? The traditional way to answer that question is to divide all of these laws we read in the Old Testament into three categories. And so this may be familiar to some of you who have grown up in, in particular church traditions that, that major on this, but they divide all of the laws into three categories. There are moral laws, which are commands that show the character and holiness of God. And those are the laws they say that carry on through even into the New Testament. There's civil laws, which are commands about how Israel was to be governed as a nation and led, and they no longer apply because we're not part of the nation of Israel. And then there was the ceremonial law, which were commands relating to worship and sacrifices and the priesthood and so on. And they don't apply either because that's what Jesus has fulfilled, as the book of Hebrews makes clear. Now, at one level, that sounds reasonable, but I don't think that's the right way to approach the laws of the Old Testament for a couple of reasons. Number one, you don't find this list or this breakdown anywhere in the Bible. This is not uh, at any, any sense of the way, biblical at all. Um, nowhere in the Bible do we read, this is how we're to read the Old Testament laws. This is something that's been superimposed onto the Bible. And in fact, when you start trying to go through the particular parts of Leviticus and Numbers and here in Exodus and applying this, what you find is all of these laws are actually jumbled up together, which doesn't feel like that's actually what was intended. The second problem with that, that I have with this traditional approach is that while it looks good in theory, when you actually get to particular laws, it can become really quite difficult. For example, take that command that we looked at earlier from Leviticus 19.19, 19, that you're not to wear garments that have got a mix of two different materials. So this sweatshirt is both cotton and polyester. So in Leviticus 19.19, 19, that's banned. But if you take that particular law, which category does it go in? It's not a ceremonial law because it's got nothing to do with the worship uh, that the nation of Israel offered to God. Maybe it's civil law, but there's no hint that Israel ever had clothing inspectors who went around checking the labels on people's garments to make sure they were obeying Leviticus 19.19. 19. It doesn't sound a civil law. But equally, it's not a moral law, is it? It, it's, and certainly that's not a law that carries into the New Testament because there's nowhere in the New Testament that I'm told I'm not allowed to wear this sweatshirt and so I feel free to wear it. And so when you actually start to analyze particular laws, I think this traditional approach breaks down. Instead, rather than categorizing the laws into sections, I think we're meant to understand that the law was given for some different purposes. And I want to highlight two of those today for the sake of of simplicity. The law was given to the nation of Israel, both as a rule of life, this was part of their covenant treaty with Yahweh that we talked about last week, where the 10 commandments, the 10 words are the summary, and then all of these other laws are part of what Israel was signing up for as a rule of life. And it was also given as a revelation of God's character and what God is like. As we now read the law as New Testament believers, because Jesus has come and through his life and death and resurrection and then the giving of his spirit, um, he has 
uh, ended the Old Testament law and fulfilled it, the Old Covenant, and instituted the New Covenant, which is what the New Testament actually means. So what we believe now is for New Testament Christians, Jesus has fulfilled the law as the rule of life. And now the law, all of the law, even including the Ten Commandments, don't actually apply to us as a rule of life unless they are repeated in the New Testament under the New Covenant. So adultery is still wrong for followers of Jesus because that's repeated in the New Testament under the New Covenant. But the rule about wearing a polyester uh, cotton mix sweatshirt is not compulsory for us. That law is not part of the rule of life for us. But the rule about you know, material mixing garments is still applicable to us as a revelation of God. So in the case of that verse, you look at that and go, why would God institute that rule? Doesn't apply to me anymore as a New Testament believer, but it's still part of a scripture. What, what does that mean to teach me? What you find is actually the very verse before that one about the garments is actually the very well-known verse that's repeated time and again through the law. Uh, Be holy because Yahweh your God is holy. And so what theologians believe is that the rule given around mixed uh, materials and garments was actually meant to represent and be a one more reminder of the holiness and purity of God. So Israel was not to wear sweatshirts like this one as part of their rule of life. That no longer applies to me. But this idea, the revelation, the principle of that verse is still applicable to you and I today, but the New Testament will apply some of those ideas around holiness in a different way. So this is actually helpful as we now come to Exodus 20 to 22. Because what we're looking at here in these chapters, and we're only going to look at a few verses here and there, but what we're looking at is these case studies, this case law about how the law operated in particular situations, helping the nation of Israel take those 10 words, the 10 commandments, and apply them into real life. And so what we're going to see is we're not worrying about reading those laws as a rule of life for us, but we want to read them as revelation to help us see how does that point to what God is like and how does that then point to how we should then live as the people of God. One scholar, Desmond Alexander, helps tremendously to kind of set this up really well. He wrote, every society requires laws to regulate human behavior. Laws, however, are much more than just a collection of do's and don'ts. So in these verses we're looking at, God uses selected examples, case studies, or different scenarios to teach the values that he wished to see embraced. See, God is getting across a particular idea about who he is, and therefore what his people are to be like. And in these case laws, case studies, in Exodus 20, 21, and 22, it's getting across this key idea. This is the big idea. That the God who always does what is right wants his people to always do what is right. See, all of these laws that we're going to look at, these these case studies, and we're only going to look at a few in the whole mix, they're about doing what's right. They're about acting justly and fairly. And God wanted the people of Israel to do that as part of this covenant treaty because that's what he's like. God is a God who always does what is right. He always does what is just. He always does what is fair. Um, I quoted Deuteronomy 32 last week, but it's a, a beautiful statement on the character of God. Yahweh is the rock. His works are perfect. All his ways are just. He is a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. And because this is what Yahweh is like, what this, these case laws are going to be suggesting is this is what the people of God, the people of Yahweh, need to be like as well. Because God is the God who always does what is right. Therefore, his people are to always do what is right. And that's what these case studies are designed to 
to teach us now today, even though they're not a rule of life for our lives. So I want to walk through these chapters or just a few verses with you, but there's four kind of key parts to this or four categories. The first section deals with worship of God, and essentially it's designed to say, hey, there's a right way to worship Yahweh. So in chapter 20, verse 23, just I'm going to read a smattering of verses. Verse 23, do not make any gods to be alongside me, Yahweh says, and do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. He's reiterating some of the opening 10 words. But then he adds to it, or fleshes this out now a bit more. Verse 25, if you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones uh, that have been shaped by tools, for you'll defile it if you use a tool on it. Verse 26, and do not go up to my altar on steps, use a ramp, or your private parts may be exposed. Now again, see, we read that and go, what? But what Yahweh is doing here is saying, there's a right way to worship me. So no other gods, no idols, that's already been made clear in the, the 10 words, but no altar that's refined and made beautiful with tools, and no steps that introduces any sense of nakedness or sexuality into worship. And that's because those two elements were a key part of the way that the surrounding peoples in Canaan, that's how they worship their gods and goddesses. They would have these immaculate altars that almost became objects of worship as part of their, their worship to their gods and goddesses. And they incorporated these pretty horrendous sexual orgies into their worship as well. So Yahweh here is saying, I want none of that for me. All right, there is a right way to worship me. Now, we're going to hit that more when we get to the tabernacle and the priests and so on later in the book of Exodus. So I'm going to not say much more about that and just move on. The second big group of case studies or laws that are going to be given now, though, are, are, are basically saying, hey, there's a right way to treat the vulnerable. There's a right way to treat the vulnerable. In other words, the God who always does what is right wants his people to do what's right with those who are most vulnerable in society. So you read in chapter 21, verse 2, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. Now, the NIV here uses the word servant. Many other English translations, including ones that you may be using as you listen to this, may have the word slave. So immediately, our ears prick up and we go, wait a minute, what's going on here? This is about buying a servant or a slave. And I actually like the way the NIV uses the word servant here. The, the Hebrew word is actually a very broad word that can mean a servant, employee, um, slave, even wider than that. But I think a servant connotation is more helpful because when we see slavery, when we he hear that word, our immediate connotation is, is the slavery that's happened over the last few hundred years in our world of people particularly from Africa being kidnapped and sold into slavery for the rest of their lives and horrendously mistreated and treated as chattel and property rather than human beings with dignity. And that's not what this passage is about. God allowed a form of slavery that was really more the idea of a contracted servanthood for people who were at the end of their capabilities in terms of uh, making ends meet. So again, Desmond Alexander uh, writes this, due to economic hardship, an individual might choose to become an indentured servant, which is the way he, he uh, translates it, to secure food, clothing, and accommodation. In the absence of welfare options, this may have provided a welcome relief for people in extreme poverty. See, there was no safety there. There was no welfare system, no social welfare or benefits for people in the ancient world. So what did you do when your luck ran out and when your business failed and you, you, you had nothing? You were in extreme poverty. Well, you could sell yourself as a contract laborer, an indentured servant. And so there are laws here around what that would look like in Israel. And as we read them, and we don't have time to go through it verse by verse, but as we read them, we recoil. But what we need to understand is what God is doing is putting regulations around 
these most vulnerable people in the Israelite nation. So for example here, in, in the verse we just read, verse 2, you could only uh, be in this situation for a period of six years. And after that, the, the master, the person who'd paid for your contract, had to release you. But then later in Deuteronomy, we're told that when they released a, an indentured servant after a period of six years' service, uh, not only had they had to provide food, clothing, and accommodation through that time period, but they then had to send them off with gifts that really set them up financially to succeed. Uh, again, you read through, you come to verse 7. Uh, this is going to make you squirm even more. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as male servants do. And you think, what the heck? But again, this is not selling into slavery like the whole horrendous sex slave operations that still happen around the world today. Again, this is a broken family with no money where they can, um, they can sell a contract on their daughter as a servant to a family presumably with the daughter's agreement, but it's a way of providing for her in a position of extreme poverty. It means she would become a servant in the home uh, of, a, of a wealthy family, and probably, if you read the next few verses, probably with the intention of being married to the master or the master's son if all things went well. And if it didn't go well, she was not allowed to be just booted out. That's why there's provision that she's not to go free, because in a patriarchal society, she would be left destitute. So she was to be looked after and protected as well. And again, we don't have time to walk through all of the details, but what we need to understand is that what God is doing in this section of the case law, in these situations, is he saying there is a right way to treat those who are most vulnerable in the world, in, in, in society, in your community. And so because God is the God who does what is right, he wants his people to do what is right, especially with the most vulnerable. And we'll see next week that that's going to extend specifically to, to the poor, to orphans, to widows. Um, here later on in chapter 21, to the unborn. And God is very specific that there's a right way, a just way, a fair way to treat the most vulnerable in society. The third piece then of this case law, the third section, is there's a right way to protect human life. Because for God, human life is incredibly precious. So you read now down in verse 12 of Exodus 21, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. So there's a death penalty in ancient Israel for murder. But what we need to understand is that, again, there will be later laws that, that add to this um, that, that can only be put in place by a court of law, only when it's very clear that it was premeditated murder, and only on the testimony of a number of witnesses. And so it couldn't be a situation that even in the states where there are still uh, states in the U.S. that still have the death penalty, where it's unclear whether the person really committed the crime or not. The way that the laws were set up in ancient Israel, there could be no death penalty unless it was absolutely clear this was premeditated murder. And we still may recoil at that, but what we need to understand is that what the law was enshrining was, was how important human life is. To take the life of another human being is a horrendous thing to do because every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. But there's some other aspects to this. If you drop down to verse 13, the very next verse, you know, if anyone strikes a person with a fatal blow, they're to be put to death, verse 12. But verse 13 says, however, if it's not done intentionally, which we call manslaughter, but God lets it happen, it just happens by accident and God doesn't intervene, they are to flee to a place I will designate. God's going to set up when they get into the land, six cities that are called the cities of refuge. And if you accidentally kill someone, then in ancient Israel, you could flee to one of those cities and the family could not wreak vengeance. You could not be killed because it was an accident. But again, see what the law is doing is saying that human life is really important. And not only in the cases of, of things that, that are worthy of capital punishment, but then it goes on in the rest of chapter 21, talking about different situations where injury may happen. 
So verse 18, if people quarrel and one person hits another with a stone or their fist and the victim doesn't die but is confined to bed, the one who struck the blow will not be held liable if the other person can get up and walk around outside with a staff. However, the guilty person must pay the injured person for any loss of time and see that the, the victim is completely healed. And, and these rules go on. There's more different situations that are described, basically saying if someone gets injured, restitution is to be made. In fact, later on, we'll read this in verse 23, but if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, Jesus is going to come in the Sermon on the Mount and say, actually, love your enemies and do good to those who hurt you. But what this is enshrining in law is the idea that there is to be a fair penalty and restitution that fits the crime. And so if, if someone gets injured, families or the victim themselves can't wreak vengeance in, in, more, over and above what has actually taken place. And in fact, later on in the law, it will also state that rather than perhaps losing your eye if you hit someone and, and blinded them in one eye, rather than losing your eye as a fair exchange, there, there was the ability to, to make a financial payment of restitution that went to the victim to compensate them for what happened. But all of this is happening. All of this is being given by God as part of this treaty covenant with Israel because he was saying there's a right way to recognize the value of other human beings. There's a right way to worship God. There's a right way to, to look after and protect the vulnerable. There's a right way to, to pr protect human life from, from being killed or being injured. And then finally, there's a right way to look after property. I'll just read you one verse here. Chapter 22 of Exodus verse 1. Whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox or four sheep for the sheep. In other words, because stealing is wrong, again, one of the 10 words, the 10 commandments, restitution needs to be made if theft happens. And then again, there's more rules here, laws around looking after property. If you start a fire and it wrecks someone else's property, you need to compensate them for that. If uh, you have a wild uh, bull or something that goes on a rampage, you need to compensate people if you hurt them. There's a right way to act when something like that happens. That's essentially what all of this case law is trying to cover. And what God was trying to help his people understand is, as he made a treaty with them, is I'm the God who always does what is right. Therefore, if you're going to be my people, then you need to be a people who always do what is right as well. And that's really what's being enshrined here in this covenant treaty that the people are agreeing to. They are going to be a people who do what is right because Yahweh, their God, does what is right. So what do we take away from this section of law that in some ways can look a bit funny to us and isn't a rule of life for us but does reveal something about God? Well, let me suggest three key principles. Number one, Yahweh wanted his people to mirror his character and be people that did what was right, just because that's the kind of God he is. Second principle, human life matters. Every human being is made in the image of God, and therefore all human beings have dignity and value. And that includes the elderly, that includes the poor, that includes um, other ethnicities and nations, that includes uh, here in part of this passage, the unborn. Every human being created in God's image is a valuable person. But then thirdly, Yahweh is particularly passionate for the rights of the vulnerable. So many of the uh, other law codes of the ancient world never even dealt with slaves or indentured servants. The ones that did normally put that right at the end. What's fascinating is that God actually begins, after the worship of him, he begins with the most vulnerable. Because all human lives matter, but God has a particular heart, a particular passion for the rights of the vulnerable. It's been fascinating as I've pulled this message together because it's helped me to reflect a little bit on, on something that's happened in the last few months around the world. And I'm not talking about the coronavirus. But at the same time as the coronavirus has been going rampant, 
there's another uh, thing that's been sweeping the world as well, a movement called Black Lives Matter. And this passage has actually helped me to stop and reflect biblically on the Black Lives Matter movement. First of all, it's really clear from this part of the book of Exodus that, that people's property matters. And we can't just steal it or, or let it be wrecked and, and allow that to go. And so whenever riots or protests happen that get out of hand and property's destroyed or stolen, that's obviously biblically wrong. But how do we, leaving that aside, how do we think about biblically this whole idea of Black Lives Matter? And, and correspondingly, the other slogan that's come out almost to counter it in some places, which is all lives matter. Does this passage and these principles help us reflect on this key moment in history in our lives? And I think it does. First of all, all lives matter. But that, that's, a, that's a very biblical concept, isn't it? Because every human being is created in the image of God. Every human being is worthy of dignity and value. And that comes shining through in Israel's law. And so all lives matter is a very biblical statement. But can I suggest that so is black lives matter? When people have used the slogan, and I don't mean I support everything that surrounds that slogan and every agenda and political thing that comes with it, but that slogan, Black Lives Matter, is not intended to say, and everyone else's doesn't matter. People are using those words, Black Lives Matter, because in America, where George Floyd was arrested and had was knelt, a policeman knelt on his neck until he couldn't breathe and he died. In America, it should be that all lives matter. But the fact is that for many black people, they feel like their lives don't matter. That they are actually incredibly vulnerable. I remember being in the States four years ago, listening to a black pastor being interviewed by a white pastor on the stage in a, a, a multi-racial uh, gathering of churches for prayer around this issue. And the black pastor was describing to this white pastor that when he, uh, just the other week before this, had gone out uh, for dinner to, to a friend's place and had driven there and then realized that he didn't have his driver's license with him. And so he had to get his friend to drive him home. And then in the morning, his friend came and picked him up and then he drove back to his friend's place uh, with his wallet and driver's license and then he could drive home. And the white pastor looked at his black friend, his colleague, and said, why would you do that? I just drive home and, you know, if the police stop me, I'll just say, look, I'm sorry, I just realized I've left my license at home. And, and they let me, you know, go home. And the black pastor said, I remember this so vividly, he said, that doesn't happen for people of my skin color. If I get stopped by the police and I don't have a driver's license on me, they will arrest me under the suspicion of stealing this car that I own. The fact of the matter is that there are parts of society in the States where it's very vulnerable and hard to be black. That's what black lives matter mean. And it's not only America. It's the same in New Zealand for Māori and Pacifica in different situations. It's the same around the world with minorities all the time. And I believe what this passage teaches us is that all lives matter. But because we live in a broken world, where sin is rampant and impacts in so many ways, so often there are people who are left vulnerable. And in those times, it is the people of God who need to stand up and say, black lives matter. Unborn children's lives matter. The elderly and dying, their lives matter. And whenever there is injustice, whenever something isn't right, Whenever the vulnerable are in trouble, we as the people of God need to stand up and be part of the solution. About 800 years after Moses gave the law, or was given the law by God, this God who always does what is right, a prophet stepped onto the scene and began to preach a message reminding the people of what the law said. He was around the same time as Isaiah, but Micah was his name, was never as well known. 
and his book has shuffled to the end of our Bibles, but Micah has something profound to say about this whole idea, that because God is always the one who does what is right, his people are to do what is right as well. In Micah 6, we read these words, With what shall we come before Yahweh and bow down before this exalted God? What does God want from us? And Micah asks a series of these questions. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Well, that would be good. The law asks for that. Or would he be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Well, that sounds impressive, but maybe that's not really what God's after. Or shall I offer my firstborn son or daughter for my transgression? Shall I offer the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? That's what the Canaanite religions did, which would be an abhorrent no. But he's setting up this question, what is it that God really wants? And he says to the people of God who have broken this covenant, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does Yahweh require of you? See, you know this verse very well, probably. To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I believe that Micah is preaching a sermon on Exodus 20 and 21 and 22 and 23. Because what Micah is doing is he is bringing the people back to what the law calls them to do. Act justly. Do what's right. In whatever situation you're in, choose to act well. Do right. Choose justice. Love mercy. Have a heart like God for the vulnerable and the poor and the oppressed. And walk humbly with your God. Micah was simply calling the people back to the intention of the law of Exodus, that the God who always does what is right wants his people to do what is right. So what does this look like for you and me as we finish? Well, my friends in the States right now, in light of the whole Black Lives Matter thing, um, the church, Chase Oaks, that we've been part of in the States, they've initiated something with a number of other churches of different ethnicities called the Unity Table. They're encouraging people a few times a year to invite over for dinner into their home, people of other ethnicities. Maybe that's a simple step you could take to simply do what's right in life. There are ministries, Christian ministries around the world that our church has been associated with that are doing fantastic things, caring for the poor and the vulnerable and the oppressed in our world today. Maybe what doing right looks like is to get alongside Christians Against Poverty or Te Whaka Ora Tangata or Bright Hope World or Barnabas School of Leadership and, and maybe start giving financially or signing up for prayer things or offering your expertise. Or maybe there's a situation you're facing right now in your life or your family or your sphere of influence where someone's done something wrong. Maybe you're the victim. Maybe you're the person that's hurt. Maybe it's someone else but you're involved in this situation, what does it look like to do right? What does it look like? Does restitution need to be made? Does human dignity need to be uh, re-emphasized? Does something need to be challenged in the name of what is right and just and fair? Because in big situations, but in small decisions in everyday life, God still wants his people to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Because our God is the God who always does what is right and just and fair. And still today, even for New Testament Christians, he wants us to be people who always do what is right as well. God bless. Thanks so much, Brad. We so appreciate you uh, coming and opening God's word for us again this morning and for bringing us a really compelling and clear call to action, a challenge to, to live out our faith, to not just internalize what we know and what we believe, but to, to live that out in the world around us and in doing so reflect this incredible God whom we love and serve and to reflect his heart for, for all people, but specifically for people who are broken, who are weary, who are vulnerable. We just, um, you know, I, I just love seeing people move uh, move to action, to seeing them live out their, their faith. And so 
just so appreciate that that challenge and that reminder today. Uh, you know, as a, as a Christian, I just love serving a God who who is for me in all my brokenness and messiness. And if you're joining us today and you you don't know this God, you, this is perhaps the first time you've been hearing about Him. Then I'd love to talk with you. We'd love to connect with you, mm. and we'd love to share about this incredible God whom we love and serve, who who desperately loves you and wants to to journey with you and welcome you with open arms into relationship with him. We'd love to to share more about him with you. So true. Mm -hmm. And we just love that God loves us so much. And we'd love to connect with you. There's a few different ways that you can connect with us. One is through email. Email us at unite at summitchurch.nz. You can connect in our online chat, our church service chat. Um, We're going to be on for some time after the service so please click on the chat or click on the prayer button if you'd like prayer or to talk to one of the people there um, more or you can also go to our website and there's lots of different ways that you can connect with us there I hope that this service has been a challenge I hope that you are feel really excited about um, stepping into um, acting out your faith mm. and if if one of the partnerships that Brad spoke about um, has really pulled at your heart and you're like I really want to connect in there or you'd like to know more about them would love to talk to you about that so please email us or connect with us and we'd love to talk mm. and help you connect in so that you too can be living out your faith mm. Um, we hope that you have a great week. Um, Auckland, we're going to level two tomorrow. Come Kids on. are back at school. Woohoo! So exciting. Um, and we are looking forward to that. But the rest of the country, we're all going to be in level two again. And so next week, we will be online, um, have church online again. So we look forward to seeing you then. Have a fantastic week. See you later. Kaki Bye. Then.
much fun.